of what we do. The other one also I'll show you a video. I think this is one of the last few slides. This is So this is, again, the entire system, even the Dabba is built in the lab. The guy did, took, took a saw, did it, integrated everything, everything all in-house. <laughs> so this we are doing it for, B, uh, for Bharat Forge for uh, hard facing their molds. So these are the applications. A lot of this our work, uh, the modeling work has been covered by uh, some of the research and uh, mag research magazines and physics.org. These were the, some of the works which I did uh, about uh, residual stress modeling. So that has been covered. So all this about my lab. Now I'll just summarize the thing before I overshoot my time. So basically what I'm saying is, if you need to have a research ecosystem, you need to strengthen at all levels. Institute, department, interdisciplinary centers, and above all, the bottom of the chain thing, the faculty labs. They have to, to pitch in. And what I feel is this scientific rigor we have been doing for a long time. We have been publishing papers. But the focus has to be on applied research where we focus on technology transfer and entrepreneurship. That's how we'll stay relevant. So with these remarks, I thank you for this opportunity. The multi-pronged research ecosystem. There are various units, and I'll talk about those units. And then talk a little about IIT Bombay, rebut some of his points about IIT Bombay's excellence. <laughs> and then uh, talk about my department, mechanical engineering department, and some of the focus interdisciplinary centers. Because nowadays, everything is interdisciplinary. You have to have a product, and you need various expertise. You need uh, computer science. You also need uh, electronics, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering. So we need, uh, I'm just giving an example. But uh, you need interdisciplinary centers for delivering projects and high impact things. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Finally, I work out of Machine Tools Lab. This is the oldest lab at IIT Bombay. Now I happen to be at the helm of it. So I'll talk about the transformation, the things I'm doing in, in Machine Tools Lab. And finally, concluding remarks. So basically, in any research ecosystem, there are various units. The, at the top of the chain is faculty labs, where you can do very good, as Professor Mishra was saying, very good solid science you can do. But you cannot make an impact because an individual, it's very difficult to make an impact. So either you team up with your colleagues, work at the department level, or basically you go cross-disciplinary and you be you can able to you're able to make an impact, give some deliverable, which is in line with national missions. I'll, I'll basically give you some examples about how IIT Bombay did it, how IIT Bombay actually worked on national missions and made an impact. So focus centers are there for making an impact, scaling up the research and doing something that, that can actually deliver a solution. So that's the focus center. So these are these will be like four units which, which are there for, for delivering research. So I talk about each of this. So for IT Bombay, I'll go like this. I'll talk about IT Bombay basic introduction, uh, some uh, statistics at a glance, what IT Bombay is, how many departments are there. I'll also list out some of the key research centers. There are quite a few, but some of the key research centers are list them. And then one of the things which is there, we have been doing a lot of research. But unless and until we actually engage with industry, or we develop solutions for societal problems, we are not very useful. So at the end of the day, we have been producing manpower for the, uh, so primary activity of institutions were creating manpower, which will man the, the industry, academic institutions, labs. But now it has transitioned to giving, giving solutions. Solutions to industry where industry actually competes because today the world is very competitive and industry needs to compete globally. So we need to actually plug in the ecosystem of industry and deliver solutions. So that's something we'll have to increasingly do now, which we have not done in the past. So this becomes very important, industrial interactions. And in my lab, I have a very active industrial engagement. In fact, there's a full-time engineer from another company which actually is stationed in my lab. And, uh, <laughs> at the, and the out, output of this kind of interaction could be Either we develop technology, which we transfer to industry, or we become entrepreneurs. Because in future, a lot of the jobs which we know will not be there. So you have to become job creator than, than job seekers. So job seeking will not be enough. Because a lot of these jobs we know will probably, and they're going out because of automation and whatnot. So entrepreneurship will become very important, and we have to be ready for that. So this is something where there has to be an investment through research and through education as well. 
So this is what uh, IIT Bombay is all about. This is an actual aerial picture of IIT Bombay. We have 15 departments, 16 centers, four interdisciplinary programs and schools. We have about, I think, 640 is the last number. Uh, we have 50 people every year, so nobody can keep track. Every week there are three or four faculty members. So I think by the end of the year, it will be, it will be 700. And uh, there are 100 uh, adjunct and visiting faculty. R&D spending is hovering around 300 crores, give or take. Support staff of 1,300, which is uh, the institute staff. We have about 10,000 students, and out of that, 5,500 are postgraduates. So 3,000 PhDs and 2,500 master's students. So this is one of the biggest programs in the country. We have like 3,000 full-time PhD students, and uh, this will grow. So we are growing at a very exciting rate. And a lot of our PhD students are supported by the sponsored projects and industry. So this is one of the things which have is changing gradually. About 1,300 project staff, which are actually funded by the projects. And uh, we publish about uh, 1,500 papers every year. These numbers keep on changing. But I think we are, we are now, 1,500 to 1,600 is what we are doing every year. And about 130 to 150 patents a year. So patent wise also we are fairly active. And we have state of art infrastructure and research facilities. So this is like a ID Bombay at a quick glance. Now the rankings. So the Indian rankings, of course, and IRF ranking, we are number two. But the global rankings, which probably we believe are slightly more unbiased, we are ranked one. <laughs> and uh, there's a reason why we are not higher ranked than 162. With the global ranking is 162. The departmental, most of the subject rankings, we rank between 50. Uh, the next 50, that's where we stand in most of the engineering disciplines. In India, we are ranked one. And the BRICS ranking, which is the new ranking which QSW has published, we are number eight. So we are pretty high up there. Few. Uh, there is one Russian university and few few Chinese, two or three Chinese. Barring that, we are we are up there, and we have been consistently improving over the years. So there is a very steep rate of increase. If if we go on increasing, probably we'll reach the hundred mark. But the problem lies is that one of the key indicators is international faculty and international students. That's where we we actually lose a lot of points. International students, we are doing a good job because now we have a fairly good population of exchange students, and they actually count for international students. So. Those numbers we are now able to manage. But faculty, somehow we still haven't been able to do that. Hope to do it soon. So this is where we stand in terms of ranking. Now the major research centers, I'll just list them some of the big ones. These are the big ones. Uh, the biggest one was uh, Center of Excellence in Nanoelectronics. And that's, uh, that was a project which was funded by National Nano Mission. One unit went to ISC Bangalore. And the other one came to IIT Bombay. And it's a very uh, beautiful system, if I would like to tell you. Uh, there is an Indian nano users program. Anybody who is working in the field of uh, nanotechnology, he wants facilities. We have uh, uh, reactive ion etching machines, we have photolithography, wet lab, all the facilities are there. You make a requisition and you will be allotted time. And for a nominal rate till, till, till this year. Now the rates are fairly competitive, primarily because the funding has run out. But what this did, what this did was actually it catapulted India to a to a very high level of publication. So we are third rank in nanotechnology publications in the world. Right after uh, US, China, India is the third rank. So in all other engineering disciplines in physics and all, we are eight or nine. But in nanotechnology, we have significant presence. And these were the things. These actually catalyzed the entire ecosystem of nanotechnology thing. Because now everybody had an opportunity to execute their ideas. They had a forum. They had resource allocation. So this actually did a great impact. And this was a national nano mission was a big success because of this kind of an activity. Then uh, there was the next thing was national solar mission. So on national solar mission, there was something called National Center for Photovoltaic, uh, uh, Photovoltaic Research and Education, NCPRE. This was about 42 crores and given by Ministry of uh, Renewable Energy. So this again, the idea was uh, the solar emission was 25,000 crore thing where India wanted to have gigawatts of uh, solar power everywhere in the country. And it's, it, it's still, India is one of the fastest growing solar uh, installation in the world. They have the highest rate of solar installation. And TPC is doing it. All the energy companies are mandated now to have solar, uh, solar, power, uh, uh, solar power installations. So this uh, thing, what it expected was that we'll provide the, the research and the support to the support to the industry, as well as what we'll do is we'll create the manpower which is required in that industry because we did not have educational programs geared towards <laughs> photovoltaic industry. And then uh, the third one where I'm actually very actively involved, uh, National Center for Aerospace Innovation and Research. This was funded by DST and Boeing. 
So I'll not talk a whole lot, I'll just give you a brief glimpse and then I'll talk more about it when I discuss this, this center. So this was a thing where India has a lot of these offset grants. You'll be probably hearing it for wrong reasons. But uh, it's a huge money. It's about it's in excess of four billion dollars up till now. Even even more than that, a fraction of the money which is being sp spent in defense and even civil procurement has to be ploughed back to India. And this money has to be used by industry so that they can supply to the global players, global aerospace players. Now we don't have the expertise to kind of uh, deliver those products. So this is the center aim at creating those capabilities so that we could we could actually deliver products and be in the global supply chain. Then there was what? Doni Research Center, about 24 crores. National Street Research Center for the Western Ministry. Uh, Tata Center, this was for frugal technologies. You have to give technology, develop technologies we are actually for Indian uh, scenario, Indian market. And Indian needs. So this is something where we do a lot, lot of research and product development which actually doesn't cater to the last person in the uh, in the society. So this basic idea is that we develop technologies which are relevant to our society. And then finally, the internet internal security. The basic idea was that you create technologies for the police, for the army, where uh, if there is an urban uh, terror attack, how do you give solutions, technology solutions, which would actually avert that and give them uh, give them technology to cope up with this kind of thing. So this was something done by Department of Information Technology, and this was actually a pretty big grant too. Now the industry interactions are very significant. There are about 350 firms where uh, there is industrial interactions. And it, there are various modes of industrial interaction. The very first one is student sponsorships. So the industry actually supports scholarships of PhD students. So Crompton Greece does that, LNT does that, Tata does that. So they will support a few students who will come and do PhD. So that's the first mode of engagement, student sponsorships. The second one is R&D projects where they directly fund R&D projects. I have quite a few R&D projects running with the industry, NTPC, CIAT, uh, Bharat Forge, LNT. So a lot of these uh, companies actually fund projects in individual labs also. And they will go at institution level also. So both ways they interact. And then labs and facility. There are some labs which have been funded by TCS, Cummins, uh, Engine Facility, Vadwani. So there are various companies which have actually set up labs. And then the other, other mode of engagement is chair professorship. They will identify some excellent people in the field, in a given field of interest, and they will, uh, uh, they will donate some money for, for funding the chair. Uh, then there is industry-based consortia, where few industries will combine hands and fund something. And then finally, we engage by licensing. Whatever technology we have, if the company finds it of interest, they can license the technology. So these are various modes of engagement with industry. Now technology transfer, I'll give you some examples, there are a whole bunch of them, only some, some flagship we are giving. One of the routers developed by Professor Gomaste was transferred for 22 crores, the licensing fees to ECIL, Electronics Corporation of India Limited. And uh, low cost directed devices by Pradesh Shivastava, these are the products which are already there. And he has his own startup which is actually using this technology. So these are very few examples. I'm just giving you some, some, some key examples here, not, not exhaustive list. He's a colleague, Professor Shur Narayan. He's a very close colleague of mine. He has a company called Sedemac. And the turnover is about 81 crores. So fairly successful company. And he's a full time faculty. He takes all the classes and runs a business. So you can understand. Uh, he doesn't get a slack on the teaching load. So he teaches whatever uh, three courses a year, whatever the faculty load is there. He still does it. He goes to the class. And then somehow he manages to run his business in the side. Actually, he takes labs also, where you have to be eight hours in the, in the lab. And then uh, I'll move. So this was the IIT big picture. Now I'll move to, move to the department uh, uh, and how department is functioning and how department actually does things. So ME is one of the first departments in Addi Bombay, one of the biggest. We have 63 faculty members. Uh, the undergraduate program, ME is the biggest in, in Addi Bombay. The faculty strength and the PhD, PG program, we are slightly below uh, electrical engineering. So 63 faculty members and two emeritus fellows, the people who have retired, but they hold an office because they, they are uh, recognized in their field. Uh, we have about 250 PhD students. I think this number now is 300. So since, since three, four years when I have been showing this slide, <laughs> the number has increased. <laughs> uh, MTech students is 250, about 125 a year. Uh, BTech is 650. So we is doing research is one thing. I still teach 150 member class, three days a week labs, and then we do research. So our uh, thing is entirely, and, and we are still very productive, despite all that. And then uh, we have, uh, uh, this was there because I actually showing in US and Europe. 
So this is about uh, 15 million US dollars over five years, which I think loosely charges to 90 crores in past five years, is the sponsored projects earned by department faculty. And consultancy is about six to seven crores is what, uh, probably more than that. These numbers are still a few years old. And about publication is about 450. I think it's close to 500 now. We do about close to about 100, 120 papers a year. Two is what, what two per faculty is an average from a Canadian department. Because a uh, lot of the older faculty members, the mandate was not to do this. They're primarily teachers. So half the department only does active research. If, if, and with that, we do two per faculty. So it's a fairly fairly good number. And they were not, they, they, in their defense, they were not uh, they were not mandated to do research in the first place. It was a teaching institution which has graduated to a research institution. The academic programs are BTEC, Mechanical Engineering. In MTech, we have three disciplines, Thermal Fluids, Design Engineering, and Manufacturing Engineering. And we have a very interesting master's program which is called Materials Manufacturing and Modeling. So this was done for Bharat Forge. Uh, Baba Kalyani, he said that he wanted to upgrade his manpower, which is actually working in uh, industry. Uh, the, these are practicing engineers. So what we did was we designed a curriculum for them, where we gave them fundamentals of materials, manufacturing processes, and modeling. And then upgrade their skills, and then we send them back to the industry. So they actually did some industry projects, and some did actually a fundamental research project. When they graduated from this, there were 50 or 60, I think more than 60 students, if uh, maybe more than that, 60 to 75 years, etc. So their idea was to 25 every year, but they were not able to send 25. So they did about 60 to 70 engineers, they graduated from this program. And all of them actually now are there in Kalyani Technology Research Center. They have an R&D wing, which is the entire IIT Bombay program graduates have been, have been stationed there. And they run the, the R&D technology there. So that, that has been a big contribution for IIT Bombay. And of course, we have a PhD program, which is pretty big. And uh, the areas where we have uh, identified or thrust areas and where we have expertise is micro nanotechnology, computational methods, fluid mechanics and thermal sciences, manufacturing, the whole gamut of it, bioengineering, and solar power and energy. So this is, these are the areas where we feel that uh, we have uh, proven strength. Uh, we have various centers. I'll talk, I'll talk more about the centers as I go there. This, this is the National Center of Aero NCAI. Uh, this I'll talk about a little bit, OrthoCAD. Uh, a beta and data class, so I'll talk about it when I, when I go to the centers. And then we have something called thermo just facility. What this does is, this was an actual setup for the, for the circuit for fast meter reactor. It was in the lab here, they did all the tests, and it was actually, the building even was sponsored by uh, IG car. So the entire building, all the facilities, it was like a four-storied uh, structure of entire thermo circuit. And uh, Suman Mashwala was, was a micro center, which was he donated a million dollars for IIT Bombay Mechanical Engineering Department to build this microengineering lab. There's a clean room and some facilities. Uh, we have active engagement with government agencies, DST, ARDB, VRD, BRC, almost all the big government agencies which actually provide money. So we have engaged with almost every one of them. Very active with industry, Boeing, Seat Tires, Delcam, Cummins, DMG Mori, HAL, NAL, LNT. So a whole bunch of industries have supported the research activities. Uh, at RD, at, in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, the AutoCAD center, this is one of the centers which Professor Ravi is there. He's actually a very well-known guy. It was a very interesting project. He worked with a, uh, with a surgeon, cancer surgeon. These were for the kids. Now, if uh, there is a tumor in the knee, this knee has to be replaced. Now, kid is not like an old person. He's still growing. So you need a very different design. So he actually designed a modular setup. So then the kid grows up, you change the length of the implant. And this was a hugely successful project. Uh, these are the, some of the designs. And uh, this was built by uh, Non-Forest Technology Development Center in Hyderabad. And he also designed some surgical instruments. So this was a fairly successful project. It was funded by PSA. And this has made to the market. And then uh, based on that, he started another center. It was a very interesting concept. What he said was, now there are a lot of doctors, right? And all the medical technology, devices, equipments are all imported. Some of them are uh, made in India, but primarily it's imported. Now, there are very smart doctors in the country. But the way our academic program works is doctors don't have a very strong know-how of, although they understand the use of the devices, but they don't come from an engineering background. So now, if they know there is a pro there's a problem, they can talk to a researcher who will be an engineering graduate. They, work, they will work together. Doctors and engineers will work together. They will develop a solution. And once the solution is developed, either this will be sold for commercialization, or the student who has developed it can be an entrepreneur. So this is a model which actually does, defines the problem, develops the solution, and delivers the product. So it actually has a proper chain of, uh, of uh, system. And it, is, it was funded by 
DST and the Maharashtra state. Maharashtra state gave about 40 crores for developing of this center. The idea was that you'll create a company around biomedical devices. This has been a very successful affair. All done at mechanical engineering department. Now I'll come to the one which I actually am actively involved. So basically, India has a very strong automotive ecosystem. So we have uh, tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 suppliers for automotive, co automotive companies which actually supply to the best in the world. They supply to the Audis, BMWs of the world. So they're very capable. Now the problem is we want to take this ecosystem and map onto aerospace. Not easy. The problem is that now there are stringent quality norms. You need NAPCAP certification. And it's a nightmare. If you're not competent, you're not able to get it. Plus the process is very complex. Every single thing, you need to have traceability right from the raw material to the product. So these things are Indian environments are not so critical in, in automobile. The machining facility, you're now machining titanium. Very complex shapes with no defects. So the software machining facilities are not there at their disposal. The manufacturing costs are fairly high. So basically, this is the major impediment in creating this kind of a successful aerospace system. <coughs> the vision of the, the, the center is to create a world-class aerospace management system. And this is what we want. Now, what we did was we identified that there are machine challenges, cutting tools, CNC programming, forging and composite testing. We'll support in every activity. You come to us, and the idea was to do a subscription model. So you can pay a small fees and just be a partner. So whatever problem, you just come by. So, so we wanted to handhold this Indian industry. We, we have done some research. The, we are still far from what we wanted, but it's a work in progress. And then now I'll come to the last thing, which is, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Seven minutes. Good. So this is now the last, the faculty labs, right, where you do solid science. But the faculty labs, I'll just talk, talk about the lab where I work. This is the last module of it. Uh, this is how the lab looked when I joined. And this is how it looks now. So when I joined, the entire lab was leaking. And there were old Russian machines, at least 40, 50 of them. It's probably he's sitting there. He would remember the, how Machine Tools lab used to look. These are old 1950s Russian machines which were designed for massive production. And they kindly donated it to IT Bombay, not knowing that what will students do with those kind of machines. This is a late machine you can remember. Who will run this machine? So although I wanted to keep this machine and keep it as a showpiece, but the, neither the department nor the student supported me. I actually wrote a lot of letters that this should be, this is one of the oldest machines in campus. This, this should be saved as a piece of history. But they said that space is premium. You cannot, you can, you can get rid of this. So this is how the machine tools lab looked. Now, what I did was I actually changed the space and I identified some of the research areas for myself. The first research area is my competency is in micro-machining. So I worked on micro-machining, I developed, this is one of the country's most precise machines. All designed, built, developed in India with my students. They have built the machine by hand. And uh, they do, we do a lot of creation and modeling of the process. And then basically we use tools which are 20 microns, which are actually smaller than a human hair, mechanical tools. So any small vibration will break the tool. So we need to understand the dynamics. So we do a lot of dynamics research in high-speed micro-machining. Uh, the other thing which I do is I do a lot of laser manufacturing. So I actually design my own optics, design my own machines. I'll show you some of the videos which I do. Uh, one of the things which you're trying to do right now is the molds are very expensive. So if molds get damaged, you scan the damage, you deposit the material, finish it, and inspect it. So everything will be automated. You just shove in a defective mold and get a new mold. One mold can cost you about 50 to 60 lakhs easily. So if you extend the life of a mold, the machine will pay itself in four mold, four repairs. Barely four repairs. The machine will be a few crores. Four or five repairs, you are basically paying off the cost if you buy new molds. So that's the idea that you can, it's a sustainable model and it also helps the industry do that thing. And then I do a lot of fine modeling and surgical applications because I'm a machining guy. I started cutting soft material and then get that data and use for surgical simulators. We are working with some of the TMS guys to build surgical simulators. So these are the broad spectrum of my research. And then we have a, so this is all we have developed after I got there. So this is the list of acquisition which we made once I got there. So a lot of uh, resources were, were, we wrote grants, uh, we got money from wherever we could. And uh, what I have done here is, this facility is open to anybody. So anybody who wants to use this facility, institute, within institute can pay a small money. Outside researchers can pay a small money. The industry guys pay, need to pay a lot of money. But use the facility. So this is the model which I use. And I don't uh, earn a whole lot, but three, four lakhs rupees a year I earn, which is which actually can 
uh, if anything goes wrong, I can use that money for for repairs or whatever. Because there is no fund. There's no fund. The department doesn't get fund at all. So I have to be independent. So this is one of the way to get independent. Start charging token money to, to use the facilities and some commercial facilities. So basically, this is how some of the snapshots of the lab. These are the machines which we have. These are the tools which we have. And uh, these are some research contributions over and above the lab building, teaching, and whatnot. We still have managed to publish a little bit. So that's where I, where I, where I publish. A uh, lot of conference publications. I'm very active in the micromanufacturing community. I'm actually uh, one of the executive committee members of micro nano manufacturing at the global level. Uh, and then uh, book chapters about five, uh, including a textbook, six patents, four Indian and two US, uh, some postdoctoral guidance, PhD guidance about nine I have done and ten is ongoing. And MTech, I have 64 MTech I have graduated within 10 years. So I have seven students every year, roughly give or take, we have graduated. And, uh, and about uh, some cover page articles also, out of the work in the lab. Research projects, we have gotten about 7.5 crores. Facility setup, we have gotten about 3.5 crores. We get a lot of money from industry, about 3 crores, 3 odd crores. So this is all for just, just the machine tools lab. There are people who are much more rich than this in the department. I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually at the bottom of the chain there also. <laughs> So I have a very active industrial interaction with, uh, with companies. We actually designed and built the most precise machine in the country. And then uh, we are developing this, I talked about the robotic exploration system which I described. I also developed initially what was uh, the BRC folks wanted to make a bearing. Uh, I will not disclose what application, but they wanted it in single crystal sapphire. Sapphire is like a gem, very difficult to machine. So we developed a cutting process, transfer technology. Finally, I developed a finishing machine in the process and gave it to them, and they're still using it. So it was supposed to be a prototype, which they would develop at their end, but they're using it as a, <laughs> as a functional machine. And uh, I also worked with, a, with a pest control, which in addition to pest control, they also build uh, sterilizers. And uh, they wanted to build a huge sterilizer, probably half the size of this room. So the issue was that they want to make sure, because this is for spice industry, any spice which is exported needs to have low microbial load. So they wanted to study if we pack the entire thing, whether there will be enough structural strength, whether there will be enough ethylene oxide to, to permeate through the, through the gunny sacks, the temperature will be uniform or not. So I worked on with all the designs, designs and then gave them manufacturing drawings with all the circuits and everything. It was an end-to-end -end solution for them. <laughs> worked with some of my uh, thermal group people and uh, structural people and I also worked, all of us worked and created this, they gave this solution to them. Uh, and then uh, for a small company, designed a fall arrester, uh, safe and armed device for Bofors uh, shell. And then uh, I started working for Seat tires. And these Seat tires, so they came to one day to, the, to my lab and then we were working on a project. And they said that you have lasers. We have a big problem. So when we do tire molding, there are vents. And after a while, these vents get clogged. Like say, if I use it for, uh, for a month or so, all the vents will be clogged and we have to clean it. I'll talk more about it. So they were using mechanical drills. You have only two minutes. <laughs> done, done. There are two more slides. OK, and then, so I'll, I'll, I'll just skip this. These four in the bottom are still going on. And then there is uh, uh, two startups which have been started by my students, uh, which are doing well. And uh, this is the machine which we have built. What I'll do is I'll just show a video just self-explanatory in the interest of time. This, is, this will give you a <coughs> gist of what I can say in words. You can just visualize yourself what, what it says. So this is how they do. They, they pack with the drill. So this is a vision system which actually automatically detects the hole. And the laser, will. there will be an optics. There is a nanosecond pulse laser and then air jet, which will go and clean the entire thing. So all the machine, electrical integration, PLC programming, all have been done by students. And they trained the SEAT company people. And then finally they went ahead and they did the installation, all students in the lab. They went 